Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our talk on CT of hepatic masses, a pattern approach. One of the things we recognize amongst the classics of CT is the fact that evaluating the liver is one of the classic things we've always done, and it's been a very important part of CT. If you think about it globally, everything we did at the beginning we're still doing. We just do it better. What are we doing when you look at CT of the liver? You're looking for the presence of disease. You're trying to define the extent of disease. You're looking for the etiology of the disease process. You see a mass, what is it? And you help in patient management decisions. Does this patient need surgery? Do they need a biopsy? Is it a leave alone lesion? What exactly is going on? Now over time, we can do things a lot better. As scanners have gotten better, we can do a lot more. Our scanning technique now allows us to do two-phase or three-phase perfectly timed because we can scan very quickly. Our resolution is much higher, so we can do 3D imaging with isotropic data sets. When you talk about scanner technology, we do have increased lesion detection, particularly for small lesions. There's no doubt the better the scanner, the more small lesions you will see for a number of reasons, less patient motion, less misregistration, as well as the fact that we can time better delivery of contrast and data acquisition so we have perfect arterial phase imaging and perfect venous phase imaging. Everything works very nicely together. Now what's important to recognize, of course, is increased lesion detection does not necessarily mean a more accurate study. Because with increased detection, most of what we pick up are small lesions that have no clinical significance. They're benign cysts or hemangiomas. And it can, in fact, it can be problematic. In a patient with a colon cancer, you say there's a three millimeter lesion, does that mean it's metastatic? Or does that mean it's of no importance? And that's very challenging because what does the referring clinician do about that very tiny lesion? So many people read these lesions as very tiny things, saying indeterminate can now rule out metastasis. They advise three other studies, which help nothing. Uh, we tend to be more with those very tiny lesions, say they're very small, cannot be evaluated further, probably benign. And I think that's a good way of thinking about it. But again, you need to be very careful, and we'll discuss that in more detail. The whole idea of incidental omas is where a lot of these benign lesions also sits. In terms of protocols, we like to give neutral contrast to distend the stomach when we do the liver. We want the stomach and duodenum distended so we don't have any issues with pseudo lesions. It's also good to give the patient hydration before a CT scan. Even with the safest contrast agents, you can't go wrong by overhydrating a patient. Uh, our two contrast agents, depending on the patient's uh, renal function, and other risk factors will be Omnipake, we use Omni 350, or Visipake 320. Now, in terms of protocols, there are many different protocols we can do. Uh, we don't do non-contrast CTs to save on dose. I don't think non-contrast helps you in liver imaging. If you want to do one single slice because you want to look for fatty infiltration, perhaps that's okay. Or if you want to localize a lesion prior to doing sequential imaging over the lesion, like with perfusion, that's okay as well. But typically, we're sitting with arterial and venous phase imaging. And whether you time things at 30 seconds for arterial and 60 for venous, or you trigger off the aorta, say, between 200 and 250, depending on injection rate and the scanner you have, and then wait 30 more seconds for venous, these all become indeed very important. We like to, in routine patients, just start scanning at about 30 seconds post-injection. You're injecting five cc's a second, depending on patient size, 100 to 120 ml of contrast. That works very nicely. Routinely, depending on your scanner, we have a range of protocols, obviously. But if we consider most people have 64 slice or better, we like slice thickness at about 0.75 millimeters, reconstructing at 0.5 millimeter intervals. We like to reconstruct thin and thick, thick being at three millimeters. We use the thins for doing the multiplanar and the 3D imaging. Now, one of the important things in liver imaging, but it's true in pancreas, true in kidney, true in vascular, we look beyond the axial images. This article looked at hepatoma detection, which was improved when you add coronals to transverse images. Uh, their big problem, they felt, was it took longer. 
seven minutes became 12 minutes. But reality is, if you have a good workstation, if you get some experience, I think actually looking at multiple planes is faster because it's easier to make decisions. You're not scrolling up and down on the axials over and over. You're able to look at the entire data set, and that works very nicely as well. Another important point about doing 3D imaging, particularly as we've gone to 64 or better, is we have these volume data sets and allows us to have much more characterization of lesions. We have a much better understanding of the data sets and we understand the signatures of lesions better. And what happens in this scenario is for the same radiation dose, we have so much more information. Simple things, vascular maps, just preoperative planning. Not to mention the fact we can look at neovascularity, nice branching of the hepatic artery into right and left lobe, GDA nicely seen, SMA nicely seen, or variations like this where the celiac, and you're looking for it, and then you notice that the hepatic and splenic arteries do not come from a common celiac trunk, but come directly off the aorta. That's very important in terms of surgery or in terms of embolization. And for subtle pathology, this patient with a stab wound, it's very easy to recognize that pseudoaneurysm, which was missed on the axial imaging. But within the volume, it's so much easier to see. Small lesions like aneurysms, what is this lesion here? Is this a vascular malformation? Is it a typical hemangioma? It's a little tricky, but in a 3D map, it's a classic AVM. So again, much easier to recognize things, much easier to appreciate things, and much easier to be accurate. In terms of staging, this patient has a cholangiocarcinoma, uh, and you look at the hepatic artery, you can see the hepatic artery is basically occluded by the infiltrating tumor. That means this patient could not be resected because the patient's vessels are involved. Look how nicely you can see that with the MIP imaging. It's very hard or impossible in the axials to distinguish between involvement and narrowing or compression or displacement versus occlusion. And the same thing on the venous side. Recanalization of the umbilical vein, nice collateral pathways in a patient with portal hypertension, very nicely shown on this 3D imaging. So that's kind of a background, a backdrop, background, whatever you want to call it. Let's go a little bit more into the meat of the topic. We mentioned the key thing is hepatic masses. Is there a mass present and what is it? That's really what we're going to talk about. I mentioned that with 64 slice, we can do better, not just for lesion detection, but for classification. And we notice this naturally as we've gone from 4 to 16. At 16 slice, this article about the paradigm of volumetric imaging. And in fact, everything in liver, whether it's tumors, benign and malignant, parenchymal disease, infectious disease, everything does better with the newer scanners. But we're going to focus on benign and malignant tumors. If you look at benign tumors, the most common tumor is going to be a hepatic cyst. Hepatic cysts are super common. The better you scan, the more hepatic cysts you see. But 10% might be a good number to look at. Older patients are more common to have cysts, very much like the kidney. Cysts are typically water density, sharp margins, and do not enhance. They can be single or they can be multiple, as in this example. Most cysts are incidental findings. Most are in the one centimeter range. These are in the four centimeter range. But again, you can see the classic thing about cysts. Water density, well-defined. They do not change attenuation as we go from arterial to venous to delayed. They can be symptomatic, however, if they get large enough. A cyst like this can cause mass effect, no displacement of bowel, no displacement of the right kidney. Notice pushing on the diaphragm. A large cyst can be symptomatic. Cysts can have septations, but that's okay. Sometimes the septations are calcified. Cysts do not distort vessels. If they get large enough, they can displace vessels, but typically not distorting them. And so here's on the venous side, and here's an arterial case where it almost looks like the medial wall is enhancing, but what you're really seeing is compression of the patient's hepatic artery and stretching of the hepatic artery by that cystic lesion. Now, we have a specific entity when you have multiple cysts, and that's polycystic liver disease. We talk about polycystic liver disease in the same breath we talk about polycystic kidney disease. About half patients have both of them. 
With polycystic liver disease, as in this case, sometimes you have very large cysts and smaller cysts. Cysts can be multiple. They typically involve both lobes of the liver. Sometimes it's an incidental finding. Sometimes patients present with liver failure. When the entire liver is replaced by cysts, you can understand why patients can develop liver failure. Here's an example with large kidneys, polycystic kidney disease, and very extensive polycystic liver disease. Some portions of the liver are entirely replaced by cysts, others have less cysts present. Now I mentioned before that cysts typically have no enhancement, but when you look at this case, you say, wait a second, look at the difference in perfusion of right and left lobe of the liver. What is going on here? This may be this a big abscess. Could this be a hydatid cyst? Could this be an amoebic abscess? Well, at times it can be tricky. If you have a large enough cyst like this, and it's strategically positioned like this, you see what happens, it's compressing the patient's hepatic veins and portal vein and IVC. The IVC compression is most critical. And what happened in this patient, the patient presented with lower extremity edema. It wasn't due to a tumor, but it was mass effect by the hepatic cyst and the IVC. And because it's compressing vessels, you also notice the perfusion changes early on between right and left lobe of liver. So again, hepatic cysts, although they're benign, when they get large enough, they can be problematic. Now, if I asked you the question, what can be confused with hepatic cysts? Bilomas. This could be a cyst, but then you notice the clips and the patient had right lobe resection. It's a biloma. Very well-defined, very nicely marginated. We also can talk about cystic metastasis. Can you confuse that with a benign lesion? Well, you look at this case, there are multiple cystic lesions. Some lesions show enhancing wall. There's increased density centrally. This was a cystic lesion. We talk about carcinoid tumors that are cystic, which was the case here. We talk about gist tumors. We talk about ovarian cancer. It's cystic, but you notice there's modeled enhancement, there's thickened walls, and some of the lesions aren't quite as cystic as others. You see some of the perfusion changes nicely seen. Or in this example, we see a, a spindle cell sarcoma metastasizing to the liver. Yes, it's cystic, but you see the enhancing wall, you see the nodularity, you see the neovascularity. So you can have cystic lesions but those are typically cystic necrotic lesions. You're never gonna see this kind of vascularity in a cystic lesion. So very, very easy. It's not gonna be any confusion. And as you go to venous phase imaging in this case, the nodularity, the thickened wall, the rim enhancement are all things that tell you you're dealing with a cystic lesion, a cystic tumor. Could this be an abscess? I guess you might think about that possibility, but the one thing you're not thinking about, could this be a simple cyst? What about this case? Well, when you look quickly, you say it's cystic, but you notice there's some thickened wall, and maybe at about seven o'clock, there's some potential nodularity. So you give IV contrast, and you see the wall is enhancing. It's just not sharp, it's irregular. This is not going to be a simple cyst. And when you look at the 3Ds, you see the abnormal vascularity, and you recognize what you were dealing with was a cystic metastasis from a gist tumor. And look at the pelvis, you see the small bowel gist tumor nicely seen, but look at the patient's primary tumor. You see it's cystic, but it has nodularity. So again, it's a potential pitfall. I don't think you're gonna have much issue with this, but you do need to be careful. I also make the point that sometimes cystic lesions like this, there's no way this is a simple cyst. If this was a simple cyst, it would be infected cyst. This does not necessarily need to be a tumor, but you, it could be, I guess, it could be a cystic metastasis. What's most impressive to me on this case is the perfusion changes. Well, when you see lots of perfusion changes, you better be thinking about the possibility of an abscess, and this was a liver abscess. Now, when we talk about liver abscesses, we talk about air fluid levels. Well, air fluid levels only occur in about 20% of abscesses, and here's one example of post-op abscess with air fluid levels and model density. But that's rare. So if you only wait to see an air fluid level, you're going to miss 80% of abscesses. Abscesses can be very tricky. They can have rim enhancement. This looks almost like a metastasis, except it was in a post-operative patient who had a normal liver three weeks ago.
And patients who are given chemotherapy or particularly chemoembolization can develop necrosis and infection within the liver. Here's a large embolization of a hepatoma and very impressive abscess with tumor necrosis. So again, there's a range of patterns. We also can see cystic lesions from infarction, but again, you're not gonna confuse this with hepatic cyst. Liver transplant, hepatic artery was occluded. It's low density, it's cystic. Yes, I know it's cystic, but when you look at all the images, this is not a simple cyst. This is going to be a large infarct. Again, you look at the vessels, but again, when you get this long geographic pattern, you're not dealing with hepatic cysts. There's no problem. I think it's a good point to remind us that there are multiple cystic hepatic lesions that go beyond cysts, and this was a good article by Keen looking at that topic, talking about things ranging from biliary cyst adenomas to cyst adenocarcinomas to hepatoma to metastasis to mesenchymal hematomas to inflammatory myoblastic tumors. So it's a very good differential diagnosis for multilocular cystic lesions, and you also include some of these things that have gone through. Now, biliary cyst adenomas are uncommon, but it's a classic appearance, septated cysts. The biggest challenge to me with biliary cyst adenoma would be perhaps looking at this and saying 100% that it's not hydatid disease. Now, one big thing that would help is hydatid disease tend to have a history of travel, tend to have fever, but also with hydatid disease, about 70% have calcification. With biliary cyst adenomas and cyst adenocarcinomas, uh, the important thing to remember is the cyst adenomas can become carcinomas, and so they're always resected. When you see mural nodules or irregular enhancement, then you know you're dealing with a carcinoma, but the surgeon's going to be aggressive regardless. The CT findings, classically large, solitary, multilocular cystic lesion with well-circumscribed margins and internal septations. As noted, enhancement or calcification may occur within the cyst wall. So that's a very nice look at cystic lesions. So let's go number two, hemangiomas. Hemangiomas are often a great mimicker. It's very easy to recognize hemangiomas in probably 90 plus percent of cases. Hemangiomas are of no clinical importance. They can get very large, or when they're very large, over 5 cm, they're called giant hemangiomas. Theoretically, hemangiomas can rupture and bleed. I can't think of a case, the only hemangiomas I've seen bleed are hemangiomas that were incidentally biopsied. Hemangiomas are more common in women, classic posterior right lobe, and a non-contrast CT can look just like a metastasis or any tumor. So if I see a lesion in the right lobe of the liver posteriorly on a non-contrast scan, invariably it was a chest CT, it's always going to be a hemangioma. Give IV contrast, very easy to prove. Hemangiomas typically are in the periphery of the liver but are not exophytic, and about 90% are classic on CT. Well, what's classic? Classic is when you see the lesion on arterial phase imaging, there's peripheral enhancement, but in a puddling type appearance, which may be seen better in the coronal view. You may see a central scar, which may fill in over time. As you look more carefully at the lesion with a little bit of time, that puddling increases around the edge of the lesion, and sometimes MIP makes it so easily because you can see that puddling. Hemangiomas typically are in non cirrhotic livers. Patients with cirrhosis, hemangiomas, which are basically blood pools, tend to collapse. So it's rare to see a hemangioma in a cirrhotic liver. And in fact, if I see something that looks like a hemangioma in a cirrhotic liver, I'm always going to be suspicious for hepatoma. As you follow the lesion out over time, that peripheral puddling increases. And as you follow it out, the lesion can become isodense with time you may see a central scar. In the old days, they used to say hemangioma had to fill in an entirety by 30 minutes. Now, we don't say that because we know there's often scars centrally in hemangiomas. Also, the earlier images like this make the diagnosis very simple. I'm not waiting for this lesion to fill in. I'm not waiting 30 minutes. I've never seen a malignancy ever fill in like a hemangioma. So it's a very, very easy diagnosis to make. As I mentioned, over 5 cm, we talk about giant hemangiomas. And in fact, the larger hemangiomas probably more commonly follow the rules of peripheral puddling and filling in centrally. They're more likely to have scars, obviously, but a very nice appearance. And here's just another hemangioma. 
And when you start looking at them, you really begin to appreciate that puddling of the lesion. And again, MIP can show the puddling particularly nicely as you go through the sequence of images that I'm showing you. And again, that classic filling in, I don't wait for the entire lesion to fill in, is that peripheral to uh, central that becomes very nicely, uh, very classic. Now sometimes I think a challenge is when you're very early in arterial phase imaging, it doesn't give the hemangioma time to have peripheral enhancement. So sometimes on arterial phase imaging, it's just a low density lesion and there's no way you can definitively call it a hemangioma. Sometimes you see some puddling which is then accentuated by the uh, MIP imaging, which makes it very easy in this case to call this definitively hemangioma. And of course, if you're uncertain, just wait a few minutes, wait say five minutes, now you see the very nice peripheral puddling, the peripheral to central filling in, and no great difficulty recognizing hemangioma. Now one rule I have that's uh, important is that hemangiomas typically are within the liver. Remember we said peripherally, but they don't hang off the liver. But Occasionally they will, and I'll show you a couple pitfalls. This was a case that was sent to me for a gist tumor preoperative planning. Gastric gist tumors, 70% of uh, gist tumors are off the stomach, are exophytic, very nicely shown in this example. And so in this case, you say to yourself, well, this looks like a gist tumor, and that's what I said. But then when you start looking carefully at the lesion, you realize in the coronal view, it's coming off the very edge of the liver. And when you look at the enhancement, you say, gosh, this looks just like a hemangioma. And this was an exophytic hemangioma. So I've seen a few cases. I've seen it simulate a pancreatic mass. I've seen it simulate a gastric mass. I saw one case where the patient was referred in as an angiosarcoma. The patient's lesion was biopsied. The pathologist saw vessels said it must be an angiosarcoma. And they want us to operate for an angiosarcoma. We read it at correctly as a hemangioma. Very important. Now, is there a hemangioma that can be difficult for me? I think the smaller ones are difficult. This is a small flash filling hemangioma, but it looks like a tiny donut. If I told you this patient had a carcinoid tumor and said, could this be a MET? I'm not sure you could say 100% not. So occasionally the very small lesions can be difficult, but I think typically it's not going to be an issue. And as I mentioned, in better than 90% of cases, we're going to be correct. Now, as I speak about benign lesions, I should mention focal nodular hyperplasia. And FNH is a very important lesion because it's a lesion that can simulate other things. When you look at this image here, you say, oh my God, that's a six centimeter mass right lobe of liver. Could this be a hepatoma? Could this be a hepatic adenoma? What is it? Now, one of the things is with FNHs, we see them frequently now because we do arterial phase imaging, we scan quickly. In the old days, we scan slowly and so this is 30 seconds apart. The lesion is gone. You can't even see it. FNH is the lesion that fills in the fastest and maybe the best. And so it's a very important lesion and one that we're going to see more of, but it's a benign lesion. It's a leave alone lesion. How does it look? Well, let's look at some more examples. FNH is very vascular, but it's not as bright as the aorta. It's only as bright as the IVC. It's often homogeneous with a central scar, and the central scar fills in over time. Hemangiomas can displace vessels, but we talk about peripheral puddling. FNHs really displace vessels, but also have a central feeding vessel. You're never going to see a central feeding vessel on hemangioma, but you will with FNH. FNH can become isodense quickly, though in this case you see the mass effect related to the FNH and you see the central scar. It's filling in, but early on it's still well seen. Could this be hepatoma, you might ask? Well, the liver's not cirrhotic, but you don't need to be cirrhotic to be hepatoma. But hepatoma does not enhance in such a homogeneous enhancement. It's always a regular enhancement, and this homogeneous enhancement is really, really good for FNH. Occasionally you'll see something a little bit similar with hepatic adenoma, but the central scar, the way the vessels are, is going to be something different. With FNH, most commonly in the women, and uh, rarely are patients symptomatic. So again, it's an incidental finding. Lots of articles written talk about this being a response to a pre-existing vascular malformation. It's not uncommon to see hemangiomas or AVMs in the same liver as a patient with FNH. So thinking about it, what do we see? Non-contrast, 
it would be isoattenuating if the liver is fatty, it could look denser. Arterial phase, it's vascular, homogeneous, prominent feeding vessel, but no neovascularity, and only as bright as the IVC, not as bright as the aorta. And venous phase classically becomes isodense. Good examples, like this one. This is a patient, it's an older slide, but I love to show this case. This patient was a med student, presented with right lower quadrant pain, thought about appendicitis. It was really a big vascular FNH off the right lobe of the liver inferiorly. This was resected. You can very nicely see the enhancement. You very nicely see the feeding hepatic artery. You see the blush of the lesion, very nicely shown. Now, in most cases, FNH are solitary, but they can be multiple. Here's a nice example of two lesions looking identical to each other with the feeding vessel going into the center of each of the lesions. That classic enhancement pattern. Another case, central scar, homogeneous. Look at the attenuation compared to the IVC. It looks identical. And you see a second small lesion near the primary. And then you carry the, another patient, same lesion. Looks like you moved the lesion from one patient to another. Central scar, homogeneous, hypervascular, but only looking like the IVC. And then when you look carefully, you see that feeding vessel right to the center of the lesion. And when you do the MIP, the vessel's even better shown. So again, a very, very classic signature. You carry this out, and the lesion even at 30 seconds, it's harder to see. You can see the scar. You see the outline of the lesion due to vessel compression, but look how quickly it goes away. And here they are side by side, arterial to venous to delayed. Now imagine looking at delayed imaging, you would have missed a seven or eight centimeter mass. So a very important lesion. Now, as I said, the most important thing is not to confuse this with metastasis or primary tumor. So key differential points, Enhances to level of the IVC, not the aorta. Feeding vessel, very common to center of lesion. Central scar will fill it over time because it's fibrous tissue and it's vascular, and the lesion becomes isodense in late phase imaging. A number of different articles. Here was a good article from Hopkins talking about FNH. FNH demonstrated arterial attenuation levels lower than 50% of the aorta, and or portal venous acquisition levels lower that or equal to the IVC, and that works very nicely. I mentioned about the coexistence of FNH and hemangioma. Here's a nice example of hemangioma in the left lobe of the liver and FNH in the right lobe. Now, occasionally, FNHs can be somewhat funny. This was referred to as a pancreatic mass. You see a lesion which looks lobular, kind of looks like pancreas, and here it is again, maybe a scar, kind of looks like it's coming maybe from the liver, perhaps, and I thought it was coming from the liver because it's being fed by the patient's hepatic artery. So I was right this wasn't pancreas, and I said it was liver. What I didn't say, it was FNH. I worried about a liver tumor. Could this be a malignancy? Could it be hepatoma? I thought it's a possibility. This was resected. This was a uh, FNH. So FNH is rarely or exophytic. Remember, I made the point about hemangiomas rarely being exophytic. Just a very, very nice example in this case. And several articles talk about that feeding vessel. This was an article by Mike Federley, and this was the article I mentioned from Hopkins. Now, you ask the question, am I certain I can't confuse FNH with a neuroendocrine tumor, vascular metastasis? Well, here it's easy. You see the vascular tumor, but you see how vascular the lesion is. And even with relative homogeneous nature, it's not homogeneous, the metastasis in the liver. It's irregular. The borders are irregular. There's a number of feeding vessels. It's very easy when you look at the signature to recognize that's not going to be a uh, benign lesion. It's not going to be FNH. So again, the importance of signatures, the 3D imaging, particularly the MIP, is very valuable in really getting this extra information without driving up dose. Rendering of vascular maps with 3D CT aids in defining malignant neovascularity with the potential for improved diagnosis, but it also shows when there isn't malignant vascularity present. So you saw the feeding vessels with FNH, but they were not malignant. When you speak about FNH, you have to then speak about hepatic adenomas. It also is more common in women, a bit older, close relationship between oral contraceptive use and hepatic adenomas, usually for more than two years, oral contraceptive use.
And it also has an increased risk with patients on anabolic steroids, as well as metabolic diseases like glycogen storage disease. Okay, very important to remember. Now, unlike FNH, most adenomas are solitary. Uh, again, you can see them multiple in patients with liver adenomyomatosis. Size range will vary from a centimeter to 15 centimeters. The larger the lesion, the more common it is to bleed. The problem with hepatic adenomas is they're in a sense a pre-malignant condition because they develop into hepatomas. So one of the things to remember with hepatic adenomas, when you recognize them, they have to be removed because they can bleed and the patient can die from spontaneous rupture or they can develop into hepatomas. So again, recognizing is very important. There have been several articles looking at hepatic adenomas, trying to classify them in terms of risk, uh, looking at three different subtypes. But we won't go into that here, but it's important to recognize that there's a lot of interest in really defining hepatic adenomas better, trying to see how imaging, be it CT or MR, can do this so that you can affect patient management. Now, I mentioned about the single versus the multiple lesions, with multiple being most commonly in glycogen storage disease. There have been a number of articles about hepatic adenoma talking about its vascularity and the heterogeneous nature of the lesion. Now, one of the issues with hepatic adenoma is they're often picked up when the patients have spontaneous bleeds and the lesions rupture, so it can be tricky. Now, what do you see with hepatic adenomas typically? Non-contrast, hypodense, or isodense. Arterial phase is moderate enhancement, but it's not homogeneous like FNH. The lesions enhance similar to surrounding liver. They can become isodense on portal phase imaging, and similarly on delayed phase, they may not be seen. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes hepatic adenomas can be very difficult to distinguish from hepatomas. You look at this case, there's a mass in the liver, has what appears to be a pseudocapsule. Could this be a hepatoma? Absolutely. Or this case, arterial and venous phase imaging. Very prominent blush, central necrosis it looks like, fairly well defined, perhaps a pseudocapsule. There's some neovascularity in the lesion. You know, I gotta worry this lesion could be a malignancy. I gotta worry this lesion could be malignancy. And you look at this, all the different phases, different imaging, to call this hepatic adenoma would be essentially impossible. So it's important to recognize this looks like an aggressive lesion. And hepatic adenomas look very similar to hepatomas, and they're treated like hepatomas. So again, uh, I think sometimes you're going to call it a hepatoma and it'll be hepatic adenoma, but that's no problem. This patient needs to have surgery. Uh, what makes hepatic adenoma easy to diagnose? Well, right up a quadrant pain, you look at a lesion that bled. And yes, there are several things that can bleed. Hemangiomas can bleed, theoretically. Articles on hepatomas, 25% in the Japanese literature in the past, used to have spontaneous bleed. We see that rare. Whenever I see a lesion in the liver, you tell me a lesion in the liver has bled and the patient has not had trauma or is not on anticoagulant therapy, I'm calling it hepatic adenoma until proven otherwise. And you can see hepatic adenomas can bleed. So you see in this case, there's blood in the left lobe of the liver, but there are multiple hepatic adenomas present. You see the subcapsule blood in the right lobe, but look at that bright lesion near the left hepatic vein. So sometimes, once the lesion bleeds, it ruptures. You don't recognize the lesion. You recognize the bleed, but you may see a second lesion which you recognize. So I know this patient is hepatic adenomas. This case has a massive bleed. If this patient was stabbed, I'd say, okay, bleed from stabbing. This patient wasn't stabbed, spontaneous pain. Now, once the lesion ruptures, you may not see it, and here's the lesion a few weeks later. As I mentioned, sometimes when the liver's fatty, you'll see it better. The lesion in the left lobe presented with bleeding, which is why the patient presented with abdominal pain in the left upper quadrant, but at the same time I see the bleeding left lobe lesion, I also see the multiple right lobe lesions, which were multiple hepatic adenomas with the bleed of the lesion in the left lobe. Very nicely seen on the coronal views as well. Very nice example. Another case, hepatic adenoma, you look at this lesion in the left lobe of liver, I'm worrying about hepatoma. There's some calcification present, which always makes me concerned for malignancy. There's a regular vascularity. There's stretching of the hepatic artery. There's, in some sense, questionable neovascularity. 
this was hepatic adenoma, but so what? Or this case, multiple low density lesions, better seen on the venous phase imaging, this some enhancement. Could this be multifocal hepatic uh, hepatoma? Could this be metastasis, I guess, is a possibility? This was hepatic adenoma. So again, it can be very tricky. It's a very tricky diagnosis. Here was one from not too long ago. It's hopeless. This looks like a large hepatoma to me, right? Big mass, vascularity. What part of this are you going to say, oh, let's watch? Here it is again. So the fact is it can be difficult or impossible to distinguish hepatic adenoma from hepatoma based on CT criteria or even MR criteria. Again, when I see a bleed, I'm thinking hepatic adenoma. I'm not thinking hepatoma, but you can be fooled. And remember, hepatic adenomas can become hepatoma, so patients are managed very aggressively. So speaking about hepatomas, let's look at some malignant tumors. And I'll focus on hepatoma and talk a bit about metastasis. Hepatoma is the most common primary hepatic malignancy. Incidence in the U.S. is increasing. Uh, it's a leading cause of death in patients with cirrhosis, and five-year survival of untreated hepatoma is under 5%. If you ask the question, what's the best single phase for hepatoma, it's always going to be arterial phase imaging. We mentioned non-contrast is not going to help. We do multi-phase imaging, but if you only could pick one phase, arterial phase would be where you're at. If you don't do arterial phase imaging, you will miss 30% of hepatomas, and this article did make that point as well. Now with hepatomas, sometimes you'll see them well arterial, you'll see them well venous, sometimes see them well delayed if you got delayed, but other lesions become vascular and become isodense. Couple examples of cases. Patient with cirrhosis, a tips catheter, what's that lesion in the right lobe of the liver? Now, normally if this wasn't a cirrhotic liver, I would say peripheral right lobe, I already told you it's a hemangioma. But I also told you I don't call hemangiomas in cirrhotic livers because I'm worried. They usually collapse, you don't see them in cirrhotic livers. When you do the 3D mapping, you recognize there's neovascularity going to the lesion, there's prominent vascularity, and what this was was a one centimeter hepatoma. One of the things I find with 3D mapping, particularly MIP imaging, you can recognize malignancies where you would overlook them on axial imaging. Here's a cirrhotic liver, and there are some funny vessels in the axial imaging, but you probably would blow that off. When you look at the MIP imaging, you see the irregularity of the vessels, the neovascularity, and you say, boy, I'm worried about this area because the vessels are too many and they're irregular. We biopsied this zone, it was a hepatoma. So vascular imaging really helps us understand particularly small lesions, lesions that would not be of concern potentially that you would make the wrong diagnosis. Here's another example, a subtle bump of the liver, and yes, patient's cirrhotic, you should worry about that bump, but look at the 3Ds, you really see the vascularity better, you see the feeding vessel, you see the neovascularity, um, you know, it's really going to be a small hepatoma, very, very nicely seen. When you have vascular lesions in a cirrhotic liver, there's not much thinking. I'm not worried about hemangioma, I'm not worried about FNH, I'm not worried about uh, hepatic adenoma. These lesions often have pseudocapsules like this lesion has, but this is going to be hepatocellular carcinoma. There's no if, ands, or buts. There's extensive neovascularity present. Hepatomas can also have uh, pseudocapsules with them. Here's a nice example. Mildly vascular, but the rim is enhancing. Necrosis, this is neovascularity. Uh, very nice example of hepatoma. And you can see the splaying of vessels when you look at the MIP imaging. Hepatoma is another example. Pseudocapsule, they may have central scarring. Remember, central scarring, we talked about with FNH, but it's not specific. Central scarring can be seen in hemangiomas, FNH, hepatoma, cholangiocarcinoma, some metastasis. But when you look carefully here, you see the neovascularity. This is not the look of that FNH case. And again, as you go to later phase imaging, you can see the peripheral rim-like enhancement. FNH, it's isodense. Hemangioma, this peripheral puddling. Here is central scarring or a central low density zone, which is more like necrosis, but it's the rim that really gives you the diagnosis. Now, 
We're also doing better. A perfusion CT is a way of looking for early hepatomas in patients with cirrhosis. You can see in this case the lesion's vascular, not a very difficult diagnosis, arterial and venous, but it's really on the 3D maps that you appreciate the vascularity. And you really nicely can see the neovascularity in this lesion. It's indeed very, very impressive. Okay, no, no great difficulties. Now, one thing that's interesting is people are now using the neovascularity as a way of predicting the angiogenesis and predicting how patients will respond to certain chemotherapy agents. So I think it's very important to really understand that this is a very important direction. Another example, look at this lesion in right lobe of liver. It's exophytic, it's vascular, it's an underlying cirrhotic liver. This to me is always hepatoma until proven otherwise. And you can see the vascularity on arterial phase and how the lesion washes off and how you really can appreciate that pseudocapsule on venous phase imaging. Just a very, very nice example. Now, there's been a lot written about hepatomas in non-cirrhotic patients. We always talk about cirrhosis in cirrhotic patients, but it doesn't need to be. It's interesting that hepatoma in non-cirrhotic patients tend to be younger, the lesions tend to be larger. Lesions have calcification, hemorrhage, and have fat within them, and they're typically going to be hypervascular. And I show this case to make an important point. This patient came in with a biopsy of hepatoma, and we're doing 3D mapping to plan the lesion. There's a central zone of low density which measured fat, and I read this article that hepatomas in non cirrhotic livers, which is this case, have fat. Well, this patient underwent surgery. You can see the vascularity of the lesion. You can see its relationship to IVC. Very difficult surgery. Took 15 hours. Patient did well. Intraop biopsy, hepatoma. Five days later, the pathologist said, not hepatoma, but angiomyolipoma. So remember this. Three hepatic lesions can contain fat. Hepatoma, hepatic adenoma, but a benign lesion, angiomyolipoma. And what happens is if you biopsy a lesion and you don't suggest that possibility to the pathologist, they'll always say hepatoma. And so it's a very important diagnosis. You may not have had to operate on that patient. Now, hepatic lipomas or hepatic myolipomas, like renal myolipomas, can be all fat. And then so in a case like this, right lobe, it's a very easy diagnosis. The other case was a glimmer of fat. So you want to be able to at least suggest that possibility because hepatomas and non cirrhotic liver still are uncommon and at least consider that possibility. Let me just briefly touch on metastasis. Metastases have a range of appearances from hypo to hypervascular. The size, number will indeed vary. CT is very good. Accuracy will depend specifically on the tumor type as well as your protocols. Uh, typical lesions like colon cancer are hypovascular, so are best seen on venous phase imaging. And many lesions from bladder cancer, which was the case here, to melanoma, are well seen typically on venous phase imaging. Now, if you look at this case and you see liver, you see nodes in the porta, you see le lesions in the spleen, I would have probably thought of melanoma. But it does make the point that the lesions may not be specific as to the primary tumor. I would not have guessed bladder from this liver set of images. On the other hand, when you give me a number of liver lesions with spotty calcifications, then I'm thinking about a mucinous tumor. I think about ovary, but I think more commonly about colon. So sometimes the pattern of metastasis, the presence of calcification, can be very helpful. Now, I mentioned that if you had a tumor like colon cancer, perhaps venous phase imaging is all that's necessary. I tend at times on my first exam to do dual phase, and I'll tell you why. If you look at this case, this is a patient with pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic adenocea typically gives meds to the liver that are hypovascular. Look at the venous phase image on your right. There are two lesions. Can you tell me if they're meds or they're cysts? What are they? Well, when you looked at the arterial phase, the smaller lesion shows no perfusion change. The larger lesion shows a wedge-shaped perfusion change. And what you're dealing with here is small lesions, when they're malignant, often have perfusion changes. And so when I saw that arterial phase, I knew that one was a metastasis and one was a cyst. If you only have venous phase imaging, they both look almost the same. So this indeed can be very helpful in certain cases. So initially on the first study, perhaps, 
for baseline, it's a good thing to do. When we speak about fatty liver, at times fatty liver makes it more difficult to detect lesions. Sometimes it makes it easier. Here you can see very nicely metastasis to the liver. They often appear to have rim-like enhancement. It's kind of the relative nature of a solid mass versus the fat around the lesion. It can be somewhat tricky uh, with fatty liver, but in most cases, I think we're very good at looking at metastasis. Now, in terms of vascular lesions, we mentioned hepatoma can be vascular. It's a primary malignancy. We talked about FNH, and we talked about hepatic adenoma. On the metastasis side, neuroendocrine tumors, renal cells, are the most common. Carcinoid is one of the neuroendocrine. If you look at this vascular lesion, could this be a cyst? No. Could this be hemangioma? Well, there's peripheral enhancement, but you see the halo around the lesion? That means it's malignant. There's neovascularity. And when you look more carefully at the 3D map, you can see the feeding vessels are really showing you neovascularity. So rim-like enhancement, we can talk about puddling with hemangioma, but when there's a ring of enhancement like this, that's not puddling, that's malignancy, very common for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Here's another nice example of metastatic carcinoid tumor. And as you go from arterial phase, you also see the mass in the root of the mesentery. As the lesion washes out, you can see very nicely the peripheral rim enhancement, a very nice example. Now, when you look at new directions, one thing that may become helpful is texture mapping. Texture mapping is a way of not just looking at the lesion, but looking at the texture. This article is in press, and with this article, we were able to show Shiva Raman, uh, James, Dr. Wang, we're able to show very nicely that you're able to separate out with a high degree of accuracy various hepatic tumors by simply looking at their texture. And here we looked at FNH and hepatomas and the like. So it's something that may indeed prove to be very valuable. I think it's a very complex mathematical formula, but the process is fairly easy by drawing within the lesion and then using mathematics to calculate. So again, very important. Now the last thing I'll just mention is what can simulate hepatic tumors. Abscesses can be one. There's no doubt abscess can simulate tumors. We talk about this case, for example, patient was found down, patient complained of weight loss. You know, I got to think this is a tumor. This was biopsied. This was an abscess, E. coli. Okay, there can be some overlap. Pyogenic abscesses can look similar. The history, the presentation can be very similar, can have rim enhancement, can have necrosis. This case, the patient was young. Could this look like a tumor? It kind of looks like a hypovascular necrotic tumor, perhaps. But the patient was febrile, 23, no history of malignancy. This was an amoebic abscess. So again, history becomes very helpful, but it can be somewhat tricky. There is this overlap. Another lesion, sarcoidosis. We speak about sarcoid and lymphoma as great mimickers. The liver is commonly involved with sarcoid. Most of the time you don't see the lesion, but sometimes you can see lesions in liver and spleen, and it can look incredibly aggressive. Could this be lymphoma? Could this be metastatic melanoma? It was sarcoid. So in a patient who's relatively asymptomatic, they get a scan, you see lesions that look incredibly bad, involving multiple organs like liver and spleen, you gotta think about sarcoid. In my experience, it's been younger patients in their 30s, They've always been related to physicians, and it's always been an incidental finding. If you have this much disease, you're going to be very symptomatic. And here's just one more case of sarcoidosis and splenic involvement. So again, it's a very important diagnosis. And again, as we think about differential diagnosis, it's something to remember. So what did we say in this lecture? We can do better than ever looking for lesion detection with newer scanners, good protocols. But lesion detection alone is not enough. Creating a long differential list is not going to make your referring docs happy with you because you're not really telling anything. You need to be definitive. You need to be decisive in reaching a diagnosis. Now, you can't always be. There are overlaps, but you've got to really think about, is the lesion enhancing? Is it peripherally enhancing? Is there a feeding vessel? How does it look arterial? How does it look venous? How does it look delayed?
If we do this correctly with proper protocols, using 3D imaging, understanding the signatures of the various tumors, both benign and malignant, I think we're going to be a great. We're going to do a great job as a consultant to our referring physicians, and we're going to do a great job for our patients. And with that, I'll stop there and thank you for your attention.